morning. Please give the panel a big round of applause. We have a really a very high profile panel. Uh, we are very senior people. Uh, let me, Dr. Minya Chatterjee is the founder of Sustain Lab Paris. We've partnered with her for the last four years for this study and hopefully partner till the time we do it and get better at what we do. On my right is my friend, Mr. Sudhir Mishra. He is the founder of Trust Fiegel. Uh, but I can say that sustainability is very close to his heart. He's just written a book which will hopefully publish this year on Breathless Delhi. Uh, he's given solutions on how Delhi can be breathing well. Uh, he's been awarded twice at the House of uh, Lords, uh, House of Commons in uh, in the Brit in the UK Parliament for his work on sustainability. And I can go on. The odd even petition is his. The in the COVID he did the what is called the oxygen bench, that was his petition. So he does a lot of work in this environment sustainability domain. Welcome Mr. Mishra. Uh, on his right is uh, Mr. Tewari, who represents ONGC. This, the, sorry, Gail, sorry, sorry. sorry. So sometimes ONGC, Gail, we tend, but I know you are more of Maharatnas, but yes, I'd like to correct myself. We have Mr. Mukesh Kumar Tewari, who is the Chief General Manager of Gas Authority of India Limited. I don't have to introduce Gail, uh, the kind of impact it has on the economy and on the footprint of, in terms of carbon footprint. Uh, it is a very important and a big player. To his right is Mr. Roshan Lal Tamak, who's this ED and CEO of the DCM Shiram Sugar business. And uh, I'm looking forward to his presentation. I have a sneak peek into it. So uh, on his right is, uh, Mr. Jyoti Malhotra, uh, he's the MD and CEO of Volvo in India. Again, a company that has tried to stay ahead of the curve on sustainability. Thank you, Jyoti, for joining. And as I said, on the extreme right is Minya. Me, I'll moderate the session, but Minya, feel free to interject. And let me uh, start by, in almost all sectors are represented here. I mean, if you look at Gale, uh, if you look at BCM, Shiram, Sugar, and then you look in auto company. I think uh, from the sectors, the very good representative of what we are trying to do. Let me start by asking each one of you, what are the challenges that Indian corporates feel when you're moving to a zero uh, in, in net emissions? Uh, and what are the solutions that you have come up with? So opening remarks from you. We'll start with you, Mr. Tamak, and then we'll uh, go around the house. Uh, good morning, Dr. Batra and my co-panelists. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, important occasion. And my compliments to you for, uh, for stewardship of uh, sustainability. This is really, as you have rightly mentioned in your opening remarks, that it is the appreciation and, and education and awareness, which is the first step. And uh, this part, this type of events uh, certainly lead to awareness and appreciation of the whole issue. Coming to this question that uh, what are the major challenges? As I represent DCM and DCM Sriram Limited is in various sectors like chemical, cement, fertilizer, sugar, ethanol. So if I uh, just come to the conclusion that what is the single most challenge is in terms of uh, achieving net zero, it is the uh, affordability of the technology because technology is very costly and though we have our deep commitment and strong intentions but certainly technology is not affordable though it is evolving and uh, but right now it is not uh, that cost effective though corporates serious corporates and responsible corporates are taking bet and implementing this initiative but to me that is the single most uh, uh, challenge as far as Achieving net zero is concerned. Thank, thank you for being so specific and short uh, in your opening remark. Mr. Mukesh Kumar Tiwari, uh, you at Gale have a vantage point to seeing what's happening and a large impact. What, is, what are the big challenges in achieving this uh, net zero emission? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Batra and co-panelist here as far as uh, corporate challenges are concerned that uh, it starts suddenly with the finances and, uh, and so that is the one area but we are the in the business where we sell the green energy basically so for us basically that is a challenge lies 
particularly in the new te- new technologies that is a regulatory environment which is still very nascent stage there are five six levers so that is especially if we'll see that new things are coming that is hydrogen or ccs or ccus so these are the three technologies or we can combine into two there is still that road map of india is not available that ccs that is carbon capture and storage and finally it has to be go either to the sea or to a different type of geo uh, structures so how to reach there that is a if we will compare because it is a waste from different industries which will flow through different lines and it will finally convert it into the lime and other things so a new economy is required to be developed a new infrastructure required to be developed and the simple example is that uh, that uh, wastage of human now we can compare with the we are having sewage line in different uh cities but for capturing the carbon and to put into the pipeline a whole lot of things are to be done so it is a very first thing that if we will go for ccs or ccus a government of india the intervention is very much required to create at least in in the industrial areas as far as gale is concerned they we can come out with a solution like uh, developing the cross country pipeline for co2s that is a one area two technologies are very much matured that is a your uh, electrifications and uh, renewable energies so if we will see the complete uh, spectrum more than 73% of ghgs comes from the energy side so we are having enough chance to get the net zero if we will focus more energy towards uh, basically greening our energy spectrum that is renewables especially for solar and wind or offshore winds so that is a one area where uh, all basically come in together and the biggest challenge lies in the green energy that is the storage part we get the energy in the day time or bindi time but we don't get the energy once these uh, natural resources are not available is still uh, this bess uh, policy guidelines have not come up how to basically compensate if will somebody is going to invest in bess so that complete green energy is available across 24 hours so that is the one challenge which we are facing Thank as you. for as far as management is concerned more than 80% in the energy gale is going to green it in our operations that is the scope thank you thank you so much again for being very specific uh, uh, let me go to mr jyoti malhotra mr malhotra auto companies uh, can contribute in multiple ways towards the zero emission target what are the challenges and what are you doing to overcome these challenges uh, first of all once again good morning to you and all the co-panelists and thank you for having me here uh, and this is i think something uh, i think i would like to congratulate you for this initiative it's good to recognize uh, companies who are doing on their sustainability uh, i think coming from volvo as you said i think we are always trying to be ahead of the curve uh, volvo has always been known uh, to produce safest cars but i think over the last few years volvo has also said that Uh, sustainability is as important as safety so i think that's a big statement uh, in itself having said that what does it really mean is that it's not about just protecting people it is also about protecting the environment now specific to uh, auto companies uh, if you really see auto companies are basically uh, like an assembly line we have a huge supply chain uh, coming from all the way from suppliers to different tiers of suppliers then we assemble then we have a supply chain for selling uh, cars so i would say uh, the biggest challenge is balancing the short term goal of creating profitability and i think a long term be- benefit which accrue because of sustainability as a as a company a large conglomerate you can still understand that but how do you align the whole supply chain towards that uh, starting from as i said those, all the suppliers and then the your sort of people who are selling and uh, and this balancing is the most important one and hence it is very important that uh we need to first create a road map for ourselves and in that road map you ensure that you have the uh right set of understanding and uh, saying specific goals for each of the supplier because they will take time we have to sort of take that into account if we just day dream that we say this and everything will start happening it won't happen so i think it's uh, good to have that clear road map and internally we have a very clear road map to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2040 and when we say that it is all inclusive it is not just what we will be doing but i think all the whole ecosystem will do along with us and i think this challenge 
i can tell you let's say from an indian perspective uh, we uh, sell our car to our retailer partners and dealers how do we align with them and when you start it's not an easy journey but then we when we started doing we started to gain lot of benefits and once they start seeing the benefits you can uh, sort of make the next moves and i'll i'll share it a little bit later about thank that. you mr mulhotra for your opening comment uh, mr mishra let me come to you uh, when you advise your clients or large corporation what are the key challenges you see on their behalf in terms of transitioning to a net zero emission uh, future and how do you think india and the corporates can overcome this challenge or challenges uh, thank you dr batra um, i'll also start with few opening lines i think um, the biggest problem with the corporate world in india so far as sustainability is concerned faces is they are poor storytellers they don't talk about their successes the way government has been able to talk about their successes so far as any climate negotiation is concerned any climate initiative has been taken i'll just give you a few examples till paris and dr uh, ms chatterjee talked about it india was not a major influence on international climate negotiation but in glasgow and later in egypt in november 2022 india became the single point of voice where even every major decision had been taken by our country for example compensation for people who are impacted by climate change was introduced by india as a concept adopted by that declaration and it was highly popularized in the whole world in united nation and all the forums so the government is much better storyteller than the corporate world that's one why i say this because virtually every major corporate house which i advised i realized that they they have lot of things to talk about but when it you compare it with how they function in other countries and how they function in india they really don't tell their story they are mostly in the reactive mode they are mostly uh, they think that there is a policy paralysis they think because i feel that when you actually see the enabling provisions most of the laws are much ahead than other countries just by one example i'll show plastic the single use plastic in our country the kind of transition india has seen it is unheard of in the entire planet we consume 4 kg of plastics america consumes 53 kg of plastics annually that's our average despite being the most populous country in the world we had a single law last july 1st we had like note bandi we had a one fine evening it was said that from today you won't use any single use plastic and you will see most of the people carrying a bag now to buy their vegetables or other stuff no story you don't have a single advertisement you don't have anything but the transition has been done by whom by the industry so i think the biggest problem is that uh, there was a time and i'll talk about few code decisions how this has shaped up and how this narrative is there the corporate world is still into lip service so far as the environmental stories are concerned or whatever they are doing it needs to come in the public domain dr charaji you are an expert uh you do work in this domain uh your comments and anything you want to ask <clears throat> it will be um more of a question to everybody uh very, very interesting views and i was just noting um a lot of challenges related to technology and we need to talk about ccs because we're doing that in uae um and so on but and supply chain as well you know very uh, very interesting um during the cop meetings typically the big uh frustration and the question is about pace we're all talking about this this is the third year that you know we're ranking why is it going so slow um and i would love to hear your comments because you all like what dr batra said you are driving this whatever has happened it's because of you all you, you know but what's with the pace how can we speed up things so as i said i think uh, one of the ways to speed up as far as we are concerned is about how do we align all the stakeholders and uh, i can share what we have done in recent past so in india our largely our operations are more in terms of selling i think we sort of import uh, Uh, cars and kits and then assemble them which is not big or big op- thing opportunity there but in the supply chain we have taken an initiative called as green dealer initiative and i think we started way back in late 2020 uh, the, the end around the covid was still around uh, and i think the the biggest challenge as to start uh, was and when you talk about pace is uh, okay there are we have a very clear list of uh, let's say manifesto of all we need to do 
to sort of reduce our uh, footprint of carbon emissions but when you go there is an investment uh, as we also heard in terms of technology whether it is small or large and always how is not going to impact each individual uh, organization who is sort of part of our supply chain so it's important for us to create a road map and that i think the road map why i just to answer to you why it has it is a little slow or looks slow from outside because you have to build i think initial few years will be slow and then we'll need to take off and everybody starts seeing benefits so our first initiative was that we said to all our retailer partners that our we, we decided each sort of milestones so the first is that okay let's look at water conservation what can we do at our workshops where the car comes for servicing what can we do about water and then there is there is a big cost benefit which you can show to them in terms of uh, it's not just about sustainability but it sort of makes business sense also then we said okay the next step could be uh, a renewable use of renewable energy solar power how can we and then also you have to make a business case with them as so this is the investment you need to make in long term medium term this is how this will outflow so and i think what we are seeing is the pace will grow when we first started the adoption at our retailers was a little slow but once the c start seeing benefit and parallelly what is also happening as you said i think consumers are also becoming more and more sensitive so now when a dealer goes out and says that i am a, a green dealer customer sees value in getting associated with a business which is green maybe 3 years back it was not so so when i think when these things will i think uh, start coming together we will see a big change and i think the pace in my belief first year was slow second year was much faster and i i know when we are working on waste management we see i think the adoption from all uh, partners sort of really going up so i think we need to be patient and as i said a road map and then stick to road map align everyone together to sort of make them continue to work on that pace that's i believe the way we can go about it thank you Thanks. yeah so uh, basically just to respond very quickly and briefly uh, there are uh, we operate in two value chains one is farm value chain second is uh, factory value chain so in factory value chain where your control is direct and uh, you are totally under uh, totally in control there you can implement things very fast and uh, most of the responsible corporates have taken very definitive steps uh, in this direction because this is entirely under their control whether it is water conservation inside factory or it is an uh, emission uh, or waste management etc etc now comes the second part where farmers are involved where consumers are involved customers are involved there is extended ecosystem there you have to align them first of all and there you have to also sell the value proposition of sustainability the fact remains for consumers as well as segment like farmers there is no economic value of sustainability that gap is very much there and until unless you make them understand the value proposition of sustainability the adoption becomes very difficult so it looks uh, it is a practical challenge but uh, uh, most of the responsible corporates have taken definitive steps and it has taken a good shape and now it is uh, it has really taken off uh, in my sense very interesting because um, you, know, you talked about jyoti you talked about internal negotiation and you're talking about the external stakeholders so it's i think internal and external stakeholder alignment and negotiation which needs to be speeded up uh, one quick thing just to i think uh, and another important challenge is also measuring how do you measure and for us we have an internal tool which we really use coming from global so and people start taking pride so i can tell you in two years uh, we have very very small i think as an organization in india if we look at i think the uh, as a percentage we are very point some point less than 1% of the whole industry as far as auto is concerned with 16 dealer partners and 25 workshops but in two years when we measure what comes out is with these initiatives we have saved 500 tons for co2 in two years and if we can do it we are like 0.5% of the auto industry i think everyone across the uh, auto industry can do that i think it can make a very big difference so what small steps when measured give you a sense that you are on the right path and sort of makes you progress uh, even better mr tamak uh, let me ask you what specific measures are companies like yours uh, taking to reduce their carbon footprint can you share some inputs insights beyond what you've shared and the same question to Uh, Mr. Tiwari, uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> so, very uh, two examples, very in brief. One is uh, in farm value chain. What we have done, 
uh, under the overall theme of climate smart agriculture we have we are implementing a multi stakeholders sustainable sugarcane production program where we have roped in various organization like multilateral organization like international finance corporation solidaridad and we have also roped in various technology providers like new holland revolis mahindra and mahindra and we have also uh, in roped in various government organizations like in institute of sugarcane research sugarcane breeding institute and actionable and deliverable of all partners are very much there very much uh, clearly spelled out resources have been allocated targets have been fixed up and the project implementation is being done in mission mode and the result of that we are implementing this program since last 5 7 years and the theme of the program are water conservation soil health improvement capacity building of growers for productivity enhancement gender inclusion mechanization and certification sustainability certification so uh, just to the information of the house we have achieved very tangible huge impact on ground during last 7 years we have saved 735 billion liter of water in the catchment of our factories fantastic this has been authenticated by indian institute of sugarcane research we have constructed 17000 compost pits we have developed 300 micro entrepreneurs who are custom hiring and renting the implements we have created 37 self help groups for women so these and there is about 25 to 30% increase in productivity in during last 4 years so these are the tangible impact and giving good result on the ground second program very quickly ethanol blending program ethanol is a as we all know is a emission is a carbon is this uh, environment friendly fuel in comparison to fossil fuel it saves uh, uh, foreign exchange precious foreign exchange and reduces the carbon emission as well so <coughs> the industry with the support of government of india and various governments and various stakeholders and including uh, automobile companies and of course omcs this program has taken off really very well this is a classical example where india has taken a very solid progress made a solid progress in during last 7 years from 1% to 12% ethanol blending program has been achieved and it is progressing very well and it will it is likely that by 2025 as per the vision of the government India will be achieving 20% blending. Oh, first of all, please give them a big round of applause. See again, uh, as these are early days and big strides in early days, uh, Mr. T- Mr. Tiwari. Uh, as far as the PS is concerned, that was the first question to that. So internalization, basically ESG matrix development of ESG matrix. This organization is taking a lot of time to coming out with that own parameters to measure on that. the reason lies that uh, till this esg matrix that department which qualification people should go into that that is the biggest challenge it is it is a cross functional thing sometimes uh, some of the things are related to company secretary some are uh, related to finance and some are related to basically environment and other things so we require a person which have a specific uh, domain expertise domain expertise in esg and also understanding that, of the business both yeah which is difficult to find so that is the cross functionality is the uh, very much required and as far as gail is concerned now they have taken away a lot of changes uh, now field people are directly coming to the esg matrix so that gap between the field versus corporate that is to be met and i am the first basically person coming from the field directly to the esg or sustainability heading with that so that is the one thing second thing that as far as uh, implementation of sustainability is concerned uh, gail is signed more than 500 uh, this uh, uh, loi is issued to different parties for supplying the bio energy through our different affiliates joint ventures and other things so these will take time i think uh, within next one year so many bio energy will be connected to our uh, this backbone of india's that is natural gas pipelines so this is the one of the initiative that uh, we are taking up now india's largest uh, this uh, uh, msw that municipal solid waste uh, at hyderabad at mitsui gail and one of the associate of gail that is the vagnagar gas limited they have joined their hands and i was there at the managing director at bgl so that project will be the uh, producing more than 25000 kg of cbg per day so initiatives are coming up but uh, that initially if a big things are coming up that inertia is there but once it starts revolving it i think more people will come and there will be a revolution particularly in the bioenergy in coming 
next four to five years. Thank you, Mr. Tiwari. I really believe the steps that Gail has taken will usher into a big revolution. It's literally a game changer as the volume of what you produce goes up and the, uh, you know, usage of uh, these new organic, uh, you know, fuels, if I may use. Mr. Mishra, you talked about narrative, storytelling, evangelizing. Uh, what are, so you said Indian corporates lack that. But what are Indian corporates doing by to be able to embrace the zero net emission uh, game? What are they doing right? We must be doing something right. No, I, I said they are doing right. The plastic transition happened because most of the companies which were using the plastics, they were at the forefront of that transition and they went through that transition. Uh, if you ask me, uh, one of the huge successes of corporates and that is storytelling is already happening in the electric vehicle space. And EV also, uh, just to give an example, that uh, Delhi uh, Air Pollution High Court is in my name in the Delhi High Court. And we always used to avoid this taboo topic of two wheeler pollution. Is the biggest contributor to this entire narrative. Now tell me, last 24 months, when there has been an odd event in Delhi? No, because the electric vehicle in two wheelers is a voluntary action which is happening on part of the demanding customer and they are buying it because it's cheaper for them to run a two wheeler than a petrol a scooter or a motorcycle which was outdated technology and with other things so the beneficiary is to the good technology company which are two four wheelers and otherwise so that's a huge story de developing voluntarily where there's no incentive on part of the government the biggest problem which is India are facing is there is no enabling legal structure for net zero as of now. So if you are a company and you are really working very hard for uh, net zero or you are giving uh, the grid a lot of uh, good electricity through non-conventional energy, there is no enabling provision which is already present in more than 30 countries and there are representations done by voluntary organizations, legal think tanks that we need enabling provisions and also a regulator like competition commission for promoting green, green initiatives and that will completely integrate all the efforts which are already being seen in the market. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Minya, uh, you have a global, uh, you know, vantage point. While you work with Indian companies, but also globally, what do you think Indian companies can learn from, let's say, Volvo as a global organization? Uh, what can Indian companies learn from best practices outside India? What are the one two three things they can learn? Think, um, well, firstly, uh, Dr. Mishra, that was a I completely agree with you. you know, the, the, there has to be a regulatory framework and a support. Resource center, whatever you want to call it, for helping corporates. Absolutely agree. That's one of the big reasons why the pace has not picked up. Um, so, globally, uh, the so Europe, you know, some work in Europe, and uh, Europe's really leading the way. And you know, I think uh, going back to some of the points made over here, the a, a big driver has been the European Commission, and it'd be the forward looking and I would say very brave and courageous uh, you know regulations being made like um, having uh, taxes on the border of Europe of any imports coming into Europe any company who wants to import to Europe that has to pay a tax to the European Commission on the uh, carbon that they have emitted which is surplus of the carbon that could have been emitted if it, that same product was produced in Europe. So, uh, and, and these kind of regulations um, no, are not only driving the businesses within Europe, but also rest of the world. So we do a lot of work in the UAE. We are working with the government, we're working with the companies. And what the regulations in Europe is doing is actually impacting UAE because there is, you know, ad knock one of our clients, they are importing to to, to, to you and suddenly they have to do cab you know they have the cream manufacturing cables and and they're all telling us that, that wow you know now we have to up our game so i think the number one thing within corporates in india is to work closely with the government and i'm saying that because here in our room we have some large heavyweights who can work as ppps right now skills are missing even within policy makers as well and corporates 
so who is going to make these kind of policies that is what's lacking so if the private sector and the government come together and make policies and resource centers to implement policies just like the rest of the world is doing i think we can go along with so i think that's one huge piece which is which abroad i see this happening and you know the it's 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 not happening over here and the second thing is of course you know setting scientific targets on things like in india we still have the habit of pulling out you know targets from the air acha chalo you know 30% kam kar dete hain 15% kam so how do you set scientific targets run simulations think of what is practical and set ambitious targets you know by 2025 let's achieve this that's another piece which i see a lot that's happening and that's driven in different regions anurag by different for different reasons the uae they always want to be the best they always want to be the largest they always scale mind. scale yeah. matters yes so you know so so uae it's that in europe it's different and in, in india i'm wondering what what would what would be the driver for that push of setting very ambitious targets scientifically driven targets thank you uh, you know i want to ask my last question to the panel before i do that if there are audience questions in their short and specific i can take them i would cut down on long questions Mike for the gentleman there. Mike there, Team BW. You can just talk. Question, sir. Question. Question. Okay, we got. Uh, you're saying there should be more incentives from the more government incentives. to be able. To, I think there are enough incentives from the government. That's another debate. Okay, sir. Any other questions? If they're not, let me ask you my last question to each one. And let me start with Mr. Mishra, and then go. On the right. If there's one thing that the Indian corporates can do immediately. in the next 3 to 6 months to be able to hasten the process of reaching uh, you know zero carbon net emissions what would you like you did it earlier actually last year you got a person called people baba one of the conference and he asked you why and you said because when we talked to him we realized it's very easy demystifying and simple so the simple message which was actually said by niti ayog in one of the conferences that every corporate should capture one thing which they are doing for sustainability now we have here all this ranking have one thing have you saved water like it was said very nicely how much water has been saved so the, that is story i'm telling you sorry i'm again repeating this india has captured maximum number of green cover because of the tiger which is the indicator species it has gone to record numbers now and we have saved the forest in this kind of population there was a binocular camera company which did a report with new york times and they were given a green oscar on that but we are not telling those stories beautiful so the narratives you know we live in the war of narratives whether it can become countries communities businesses so what mr mishra is saying that we have to be able to evangelize what we do but people baba is a gentleman i know his real name is a guy who planted more trees uh, i met him in some other context 20 years back and then he became my friend he has planted more trees than anyone i know and he's a very educated person very simple person just goes about planting trees on a daily basis and he was part of our recycling conference so, uh, that's what mr mishra is referring to mr tiwari uh, if there's one thing that you'd like to see indian corporates do better they can learn from gale or some other practice you've seen in other corporates that gale can learn as far as gale is concerned basically uh, we are a transportation in natural gas company so the first transition fuel for getting net zero or uh, minimizing the your uh, carbon footprint i think more adaptation towards the natural gas and bio energy that corporate can come up and recently i think hero motor corporation that have come to us they want cbg so that is a one area demand should come from the corporate for cbg so that naturally market will develop and we will have a more greening in energy sector that is the Beautiful. easiest way i think that one practice can uh, make the difference mr tamak yes uh, 
So, first and foremost, identify themes which are relevant for that particular corporate in their operations. Like, for example, in our case, we have chosen water conservation, replacing fossil fuel, and adoption of circular economy. These three initiatives have been identified. And besides uh, productivity enhancement of sugarcane growers. So, then create uh, partnerships. You should choose capable and credible partners to implement the program. And then science-based targets should be fixed up. A roadmap should be prepared. Allocation of resources should be done. And then implement that project in project and mission mode. Thank you, Mr. Tawak, again for being so specific. Uh, Mr. Malhotra, your final comments. Yeah, if I think if I were to uh, have one wish list, so to say, I think uh, just to add to what Mr. Sudhir Mishra said, is about adoption of EVs. Uh, we are, uh, globally we have said that we want to become a fully electric vehicle company and I think in India we can do it faster. And not only for us, I think each of the organization when it comes to mobility should use the best possible uh, means of green mobility. EV can support. But one important aspect of that, uh, and when, um, again Mr. Mishra talked about it, is the regulatory enablement. And it's not about incentives. For example, I can give you a small, uh, it's not very easy even today if you were to buy an electric vehicle and you want to install a, your own charger at home. I think the enabling, each each state in India has a different uh, sort, of red, uh, uh, sort of way of getting it done. Delhi is much easier, you go to Gurgaon, it's very challenging. Each within Gurgaon, each RW has their own whims and fancies to allow you or not to allow. Solar, we, I think somebody in the, from the audience said, solar is not about the money, it makes economic sense. But uh, to get it done, uh, get the permissions done is a big challenge. So I think we need this uh, adoption and we need the enabling uh, sort of support from all stakeholders. As a corporates, we can do what we can, but we need, I, th I think, uh, build this uh, together and make it done. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Malhotra. You want to make a I quick comment, Mr. Mishra? Yeah, something very interesting, I can tell you, that electric scooters, uh, there was no concept of multi-brand. So, one of uh, my client had this issue because he sells all the scooters in one roof, like we just sells, sells all the fridge and TV. So, the government said, no, it's not possible. Either you can sell Volvo or or you can sell Maruti or you can sell this thing. So I had to actually in few states I managed to change the law that how you can in a single roof you can sell all electric vehicles of different scooters because you have to you cannot have a conventional model for that because then you need an amendment in Motor Vehicle Act and also the certificate which you get for doing an operation. Similarly, the other example is we did a air pollution report in this December for Delhi on behalf of a university that how the pollution is less and there is a reason one particular state has done a great job. A state had a cold feet later that if we acknowledge this report and celebrate this, it means air pollution happens because of the agriculture waste. So they said, no, we have nothing to do with this report. And I have kept it 10 copies with me, maybe sometime later after 10 is like a will, it will be opened. Dr. Chatterjee, your final comments. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about that one piece of Reva. You know, you, you all know Reva and Reva initially, they didn't get the go ahead from policymakers to start off in India because they said, you know, electric car, what, how can cars run on electricity? They had to go to London and there was this photo uh, in the newspapers of the whole parking lot in, in one part of London, which was Chetan's, um, uh, you know, Chetan was driving it and the whole parking lot was filled with Reva and that's when Indian policy makers, they brought him back. I was like, okay, <laughs> let's do it. But anyway, but, but anyway, um, I think um, I, you know, the great discussion and it's such a great start to the event. Um, um, three, just three things for corporates to um, drive corporate sustainability and I call it the three C's. So, you know, the first one is um, to um, conceive sustainability with everybody in the company. It has to be bottom up and top down everything because it has to be a very consultative process because ultimately it is the whole company which will have to implement it. So, if you don't conceive it in a consultative process, you know, it doesn't go very far because people will not feel it's their idea. The second um, C is is... Very, and I didn't hear this piece much in this panel, which is to cast sustainability well. You have to empower 
sustainability. You have to empower that department. Um, Merrill Lynch, one of the banks I used to work at, I was an unpaid intern at Merrill <laughs> many, many moons ago with my first job in investment banking. And there, the whole bank went down because, uh, you know, the risk manager, he was uh, put aside, put in a corner on the trading floor, wasn't given, wasn't empowered enough. And the whole bank went down because it was basically that insight which was missing on the amount of debt the, uh, the bank had. And um, companies which are having CSOs right at the top, the number three person, number, you know, CEO, CFO, CSO, that, these are the ones who are actually leading. You know, I should have mentioned that in my trend. So how do you empower and cast sustainability? And the third one, which I think we've all spoken about is collaborate, you know, partnerships, collaboration with the government, with other companies, with platforms. Don't reinvent the wheel, you know, collaborate, partner and do things together with employees, etc. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please give Mr. Mishra, Mr. Tiwari, Mr. Kamak, Mr. Malotra, and Mr. Sadaji a big round of applause. You can do better. Clapping is good for art, Mr. Thank you so much. I think it's a, it's a good start. I think uh, India is today leading in many domains. Uh, I, just, I, I had the good opportunity to interview the uh, power minister. And he said, we are keeping our, he gave me data on how we are keeping our commitment. And we are ahead of the world in yeah. terms of our timelines to achieve whatever milestones uh, we have committed to as a country. So I think even in the ESG and sustainability, India will eventually lead in all parameters and show the way and with uh, leaders and organizations represented on this panel and in this room will lead the way. Uh, thank you for being a good panel and being a very specific panel. Uh, one of the panels where every panelist has been very specific rather than uh, talking journal. So I hope that trend continues throughout the day and we learn about best practices to be able to benchmark from them. Thank you so much. Give them a big round of applause again.